looks like we're live, everybody. Uh, you are in for such a special treat today. Um, I'm here with Dr. Corson, and I'm going to introduce her in just a moment here. Um, she's a wonderful guest, and we haven't known each other that long, although we've been in the same circles for years. So I've known of her and have had the greatest respect for her work and um, the lectures she's just given recently about Fibrin. We're going to dive into that in just a minute or two. Um, but before we do, I want to give you just a little background. Um, you all know me. You've probably been here before. Um, if you want any of the past interviews, you can see everything that I've recorded on my YouTube channel. It's all free, and there's like 60 plus hours of interviews with great experts like Dr. Corey in here. And that's just on my YouTube channel under my name, Jill Carnahan. If you do go there and enjoy them, please subscribe. So you stay updated on the new content and this video, um, depending on where you're watching it, will either um, land on YouTube in a week or so, um, or maybe you're watching live. Uh, other background, if you want other information on blogs or um, things on my website, it's just jillcarnahan.com. And I don't often mention products, but if we do, you can find those on drjillhelp.com. So I am absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Ann Folk Corson. She grew up in Southeastern Pennsylvania and um, obtained the Doctor of Medicine degree in 1982 from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia. She's been board certified in family medicine, just like me, <laughs> since 1983 and in integrative holistic medicine. So we have the same um, credentialing too. Integrative family medicine is a unique field that combines modern Western medical science, traditional herbal medicines and nutrition as informed by philosophies of ancient Chinese medicine. Um, and again, we practice very similar too. Uh, what's, I'm sure what Dr. Corson and I both have seen is we have this wonderful foundation of Western science, but then it's like our toolbox is bigger now that we're able to use all these other modalities as well to help people. And I don't know about you, Dr. Corson, but I find um, we need those tools, right? We need everything possible nowadays with a complex chronic illness. Um, she approaches environmental, infectious, dietary, metabolic, biochemical, endocrine, immunological, structural, emotional, and spiritual detriments to disease. And her practice focuses on identifying and addressing the root cause of each patient's illness. She has a solo practice in Philadelphia. And we were both just saying before we got on here how, um, gosh, the patients are coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> it's actually really hard to keep up. I think that as you know, COVID hit, people packed away, they're starting to come back out and realize how important health is. We're both just realizing the need to educate. And one of the things you'll find today, whether you're a clinician listening or a patient, this information is really, really important. Um, she has um, so many uh, awards, credentials. She's been speaking around the world. Um, I won't read the rest of this here, but you can find her and your website, Dr. Corson, where can they find you? Uh nfcorsonmd.com. It's a very rudimentary website, so don't expect much from it at all. That's okay. Well, we are so delighted to have you here. So welcome and thanks for coming. And before we jump into the fuss about fibrin and what this, what, what this is all about, why it's so important to the people listening to if you're a practitioner or patient, I would love to hear just a little bit about your journey is very, very parallel to mine with the family medicine and then the holistic integrative and how did you get into medicine and how did you get into integrative medicine? Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, I, I come from a long line of doctors and for some reason it was uh, my siblings, it was always me that was going to be the doctor. Although at first I thought I was going to be a neuroanatomist. And so I sort of rebelled and went to graduate school in neuroanatomy before turning around to go to medical school. Um, but I just seemed to, you know, fall into that naturally. And the the nervous system was my first love. So I was thinking neurology or something like that. And I started out that way, but then I really found that that was very limiting. So I actually, you know, became an emergency physician. Um, and I practiced emergency medicine for uh, close to 15 years, not quite. And then my only child got quite ill and it took me a couple of years to figure out what it was. Um, and I remember uh, complaining to um, a friend of mine one day, you know, I can't figure out what's wrong with him. And he, and he said, well, he's got Lyme disease. Look at the symptoms. I said, well, I've done the ELISA three times and it's come out <laughs> negative, right? That's what the American Academy of Family Medicine always tells us to do. Um, and so he gave me a flyer for a lecture that Dr. Joe Bruscana was giving on the 3rd of May or the 8th of May, I can't remember quite, 2003 at the local high school here in Chester County, Pennsylvania. I went and I was just so enthralled. I learned more in that lecture than I had in years of uh, you know, going to medical meetings and whatnot. And so 
I realized that my son had Lyme disease in 2003. So I um, immediately, uh, within just a, a little a short time after that uh, lecture, asked uh, Bruscano if I could come visit him in his office, because that's the way we learn things in medicine, yeah. right? Yeah. You see one, do one, teach one, right? So you have to learn. And so he, he said, well, that's okay. No one's ever done that. <laughs> so I started the whole physician training program with eyelids. Wow. Because I was the first one to ever ask. <laughs> and he said, you know, next week I've got somebody coming from Wales. And so David Owens came the next week. So I spent time learning with him. I had gone back. I went first in July and then went back in September of 03. Then a couple of years later, I went and trained with uh, uh, Charles Ray Jones in, in Connecticut. Um, but man, I just hit the floor running in the summer of 2003 with Lyme disease and just started my own treatment. I'd been an ER doctor and I'd done primary care in, in family practice offices and workman's comp situation. I'd helped in the ER and the OR and I worked ER. So I had a lot of primary care clinical experience. And so, but I found that these were the most complicated patients you could imagine. And then in 2004, I was a local psychiatrist by the name of James Schaller that were sharing patients with me. And he said, well, you, you also have a mold problem, Anne. I said, what do you mean? So he gave me a pre-print copy of Mold Warriors. So I learned about mold in 2004. So I started treat, t treating mold in 2004. And then I had a patient come to me and she put a bottle of Toxex on my desk, which is a Pecana product. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I don't know what this stuff is, but this is really good. S blank, blank, blank. She says, I took two drops of it and I was sick for a day and a half. So I said, well, I gotta look this up. And so I looked up the company and I started, you know, exploring all of these, you know, um, natural remedies. And I learned about German biological medicine. And, and I also just dumb, jumped right in the deep end. And I went to all these trainings by Gary and Rain Klepper and some of these other people and got into sort of that Northern California naturopath community. Right. And I just found my tribe, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was in 2005. So I learned about hypercardiability way, way back in 2005 from Gary Klepper, who learned it from David Berg, you know, a couple of years prior. Right. So I just, you know, again, I just, you know, hit the floor running and kept going. And I've just found a wonderful armamentarium of medicines and things to use for my patients. And then, you know, just have been growing and growing and growing, you know, all these years. And it's just been a blast because it's so much fun to help whole families get better, you know. Oh, what a beautiful journey. And it's so driven by, um, same as my journey, by this inquiring and curiosity, right? When we hit, again, we've got a great training background and I have all the respect in the world for our allopathic training in medical school. And yet we ran into limitations in our own lives. And it's like, what else is possible? And then what else is out there? And then we start to realize, oh, there's a whole nother world of ability to treat and help. And I feel like it's just the best way to really combine Western allopathic medicine with all of these other things, because they really add, like you, I learned so much from my naturopathic friends. Um, so hypercoagulability, let's first define it, but I just want to say my personal experience, I've known about this. I've known how it correlates with Lyme and complex chronic illness like mold and COVID. And um, so I want you to describe a little bit about what does that mean for people who are lay persons, vibrant and hypercoagulability. But I will say, um, I felt like this is one of those really missing links in a lot of practitioners toolboxes to really understand how much this affects so many of their chronic patients. So I think was, yeah, go ahead. It's so true because the issue of hypergarchability is really often overlooked even by the most experienced integrative practitioners. You know, people will often come to me after being to many people that I respect greatly. And it's one of the things that's not been looked at at all. But unfortunately, it's really present to some degree or another in almost every chronically ill patient and is present in acutely ill patients as well. So think about it. Everyone's had the flu, right? Everyone's had a fever, a headache body aches and pains, fatigue, nausea, insomnia, right? A lot of those symptoms uh, can be exacerbated by the hypercoagulability that happens when there's any inflammation in the body, right? So an acute inflammatory response from a flu can also drive, it also drives the hypercoagulable fibrin product producing um, response in the body. So whenever we acquire it, we have a, you know, a brisk innate immune system response. Then part of that innate immune system response activates the coagulation cascade, which is this domino effect where the body creates more soluble fiber. And so a lot of these symptoms can be attributed to that. Mm -hmm. And acute or chronic innate immune system activation 
you know, heavy metal toxins, mold toxins, you know, chronic mast cell activation, uh, Herxheimer reactions, inflammation of any kind can result in the generation of excess soluble fibrin. Now, so what's hypercoagulability? Well, the body maintains this wonderful balance, this seesaw balance, del very delicate balance, is very redundant of proteins that either encourage or discourage blood clotting, yes. right? This is a very, very complex and redundant system. And it's very, very important because after the injury to a blood vessel, we need to be able to immediately plug and stop that bleeding. But we also have to stop the formation of that clot so that we don't make so much clot that we block that blood vessel and damage tissues, right? You have to excuse me, I'm in the middle of a big thunderstorm here. So if I get interference in my internet connect, I'm on an ethernet cable, so hopefully it'll be all right. So you've got to be able to either, you know, plug or thin, clot or unclot all the time. Now, when this delicate seesaw is in balance due to a genetic factor, a, an environmental factor, a toxin infection, emotional stress, a physical stress, like a physical trauma, a surgery, something like that, then it can result in too much soluble fiber being made and not being able to degrade it enough, right? So when you can't degrade it enough, you end up being sticky. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of the sticky side. And so you have an abundance of molecules that are encouraging, you know, the formation of fibrin and blood clotting over blood thinning. Um, and so these are many different causes that can precipitate us into it. Well, what is actually soluble fibrin? Okay, so um, the coagulation cascade proteins are a series of molecular reactions that result in the production of fibrin. Fibrin molecules can either be soluble and free floating in the bloodstream, or they can become insoluble and cross linked, and that creates a clot. It takes a burst of thrombin to actually cross link them and make them a clot. They're kind of like interlocking Lego toy pieces. Okay, that's the clot. But generally in the absence of a tear in a blood vessel wall, you don't actually get that cross-linking happening, that burst of local thrombin that causes the interlocking. So you generally just get excessive soluble fibrin produced right in the area. And that creates a sludgy yes. uh, layer on the surface of the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. Um, and just one micron, which is one millionth of a meter, thick layer of soluble fiber along the inner lining of the capillary reduces the diffusion of oxygen molecules out of the blood into the tissues by 500% wow. uh, with resulting tissue hypoxia. And that was uh, referenced in a, uh, Nemerson had given a, a, a lecture at a 2003 meeting. I, I can't find the original article, but the information about um, you know, Dr. Nemerson, I can give you, but Dr. David Berg references this in a lot of his lectures that he gave over the years about hypercoagulability and uh, it's a wonderful picture of the you know, capillary, which we can show if you'd like. But so even a small amount of soluble fibrin in the bloodstream and that sludging can create very significant clinical symptoms. Yeah. And most allopathic medicine doesn't even think about it until you've got blood clot, right? Like a DVT or briefly a about the symptoms, because that's where people listening it always. And that for me, that's been a big. What would a patient look like that had an issue with this? And it's probably going to be very non-specific, right? Because <laughs> there's lots of right. Yeah, and then after that, I'd like to sort of talk about the different ways the body deals with coagulation, because uh, especially in our current era, um, we need to think about platelets as well as fibrin formation. Um, so the um, signs and symptoms of the hypercoagulability. Okay, if you wake up in the morning and you're stiff all over your body, or you've been sitting for a while and you get up and you feel stiff, um, if you're nauseated upon awakening, or if your appetite's very poor in the morning, um, sometimes painful teeth or a sensation of the teeth being loose, having very poor aerobic exercise tolerance where you have post-exertional fatigue shortness of breath with exercise and exacerbation of pain with exercise mm -hmm. where your muscles just get so painful. Um, if you have um, other kind of um, fatigue um, and um, 
issues with insomnia. Let me just see if I'm missing anything. Hold on. Brain fog, mm -hmm. irritability, mm -hmm. anxiety is a big, huge yeah. one. I often will treat hypercoagulability with fibro anxiety with fibrolytic enzymes. Or you can have depression, you can have mood swings, a fatigue, generalized pain that can be utterly debilitating, you know, kind of like I just hurt everywhere. Every time you touch me, I hurt because the tissues are hypoxic. You can have painful numbness or pins and needles, sharp stabbing shooting pains, deep aching pains, especially in the arms and legs. You have limbs that fall asleep really easily or inability to, as I say, tolerate aerobic exercise with worsening of pain and fatigue after exercise. Yes. So, and insomnia can be included in that. And as well as restless legs when you're laying down trying to go to sleep at night and you just can't get comfortable and you just got ants and pants in your pants and you're just, you're restless and your legs just can't get comfortable. Often that's hypercoagulability um, at night. Um, so those are sort of the major symptoms that people will have with it. Now, what about oh, the physical? Uh, what about headaches and migraines? Would you put those in that class or not necessarily? They can. Uh, that is very good to, to add that, especially with some of the side effects that people are now seeing um, after being vaccinated. Um, the headaches and uh, migraines, you know, can be a sign of sludging as well as serious clotting in yep. the, yeah. the brain vasculature. So, yes, thank you for adding that. Good. And so you did, you talked about fiber and you got the sticky blood, you gave symptoms and that would probably include this whole hypercoagulability hypoxic thing. And then you want to go into platelets. I kind of interrupted you. Do you want to go? You know, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about what the physical signs are because Perfect. people can see these in themselves. Perfect. Um, as well as the clinicians that are listening can see them in their patients. So you know how people sometimes get mottled skin when they're cold, and yeah. especially you see that in babies and infants. Well, if people have chronically mottled skin, they may be hypercoagulable. Yeah. They have cold, clammy extremities, but they're centrally warm. Um, they have very prolonged capillary refill in their fingers and their toes. They can have a very pale, swollen tongue with scalping of the tongue edges from indentation from the teeth. That's not just hypo. Thyroidism, that can also be splenic congestion, hypercoagulability. Uh, and then you can have a very doughy abdomen when you examine someone's abdomen with peri uh, fullness and, and tenderness. And you can see generalized sort of soft tissue congestion as if the tissues are just sort of boggy. They say, well, you know, it's like I used to be able to see my tendons in my hands and now I can't even see them anymore. Um, often the, um, the head and neck can be very red or ruddy in color upon laying down. And then the feet, when people are sitting, can be really red or purple or deep, you know, purple when they're sitting on the, the exam table and their feet are just hanging. And then there's often a very significant compromise of cognitive function, not only with irritability, but emotional lability. Excellent. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you listening with your clinician or uh, patient are resonating, especially if you've dealt with Lyme and mold. I really think, like I said, Dr. Corson, this is such an important piece of many, many of our chronic patients. And we, I mentioned COVID, but any virus, especially an inflammatory virus like COVID can also be in this pathway as well, correct? Yes, that's correct. It doesn't have to be, but um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I don't want to get it into it right yet. Okay, so now, how does the blood coagulate? You know, there are three main mechanisms. Number one, if your platelet behavior yes. and whether platelets have been activated to, to clump, right? And that's separate from the protein cascades that either make fibrin or break down fibrin. Yeah. So it's platelet behavior, fibrin formation, and fibrin degradation. Got it. Those are the three main mechanisms that are controlling it. Now, Platelets will aggregate and stick in response to trauma to the blood vessels, mm -hmm. in response to immune system activation by toxins or infections. And one of the problems with the spike protein is that it activates platelets. Yeah, yeah. It also damages endothelial lining. That also stimulates the coagulation cascade. So you've got two things you have to think about in this scenario now, what we're currently dealing with, mm -hmm. with the spike protein. Yeah. Both in natural infection and vaccination is not only platelet you know activation and also fibrin formation. So the treatment for that is going to be a little bit different than what we would do for just someone who's got hypercoagulability from mold toxins or heavy metal toxins or you know some other issue. So 
Um, again, it's always this physiological balance between formation degradation. Normally, platelet uh, you know, aggregation is pretty easy to deal with. You know, you normally use, um, you know, high dose essential fatty acids, you know, vitamin D, and sometimes, you know, baby aspirin, uh, things like that. You know, usually you think of platelets being pretty easy to deal with, but the intensity with which platelets aggregate, uh, given our current issues that we're dealing with uh, in our country, uh, we have to be very, very aggressive about that. But we have to buffer both um, for the fibrin formation and platelet activity. Are you recommending antiplatelet therapy for patients who have either had long haul COVID or post vaccination is issues? Um, yes, uh, but primarily very high dose, you know, vitamin uh, uh, essential fatty acids. Um, I usually try to get between three to four grams a day of a very pure omega three, yeah. uh, and then at least you know uh, four hundred international units of vitamin E. And depending on their symptomatology and what else they need. Uh, maybe a baby aspirin a day. You really have to block platelet activation. And unfortunately, you know, the, the blood test that we do to evaluate coagulation, we used to be able to get platelet activation testing, but um, when Esoterix uh, was bought by LabCorp, they dropped that test. Uh, so, you know, initially David Berg had set up Hemax and then Esoterix bought it and then LabCorp bought Esoterix. So you can get these tests all through LabCorp, but they, they drop the ones that yes. indicate whether the platelets have been activated. And that's a real problem because nowadays we really need to know. We need it, right? I've noticed that too. It's hard to get the information that we need. Yeah, it's very hard. You can get your information about your, you know, your fiber uh, formation and degradation uh, and your, your um, thrombin formation and degradation. And you can get some clue as to the genetic issues that people have, but it's very difficult to get information about platelets. So it's safer to, treat them as if their platelets are, are right. going to be activated. Quick question yeah. on that, because obviously with like Crohn's or colitis or some inflammatory disorders, we see thrombocytosis, which for those of you who don't know, it's excess platelet production, not necessarily how they behave. Would just thrombocytosis alone also contribute to issues or would it have to be the activation of those excessive platelets? No, whenever you've got too many cells, of course, it depends on how you, how you get, you can get all kinds of sludging and, and blockage. Yeah, just when you have abnormally shaped red blood cells in right. sickle cell anemia, or you have babesia and you have some other red blood cell inclusion and the red blood cells can't squeeze through the capillary beds, you're gonna have some problem, yeah. yeah. So we talked about the, the symptoms of hypercoagulability. We talked about the physical signs of hypercoagulability. Um, Again, you know, a good way to start dealing with it is again to, you know, really help with your omega-3 to 6 ratio. Most people in this country need very high dose omega-3s for a prolonged period of time. Um, you really need to optimize your liver detoxification pathways, but you're not going to do that until you fix your gut dysbiosis. And what I'm finding is that the vast majority of people, at least in this part of the country where we have a, a great deal of glyphosate used in our agricultural areas, very around, you know, all around southeastern Pennsylvania, is that their lactobacillus has been totally wiped out. Yeah. It's just not growing at all in their stool tests. Um, so we need to make sure that we are fixing that gut dysbiosis by trying to restore the lactobacillus. Uh, the best way to do that is, uh, so far I'm finding, is to really uh, have as clean a diet as possible to, you know, bind and get rid of the glyphosate that you have in the body. You have to replace the manganese and other trace minerals because uh, manganese is very essential for lactobacillus to grow. And then I use a very, you know, high dose lactobacillus um, in order to try to replace that along with you know, your normal prebiotics or whatever you like to use for gut dysbiosis. Yeah, so for one of the patients who are listeners who don't know, glyphosate was originally just a mineral chelator and they found it to have this anti-herbicide effect, but the minerals it chelates is also in our gut. So when they do the studies on the cells, they're like, oh, there's no problem, but it has a massively profound detrimental effect to our gut because it preferentially will chelate those minerals that our lactobacillus and bifidobacter, our probiotics need to survive. So thanks for mentioning that because I uh, see that all the time as well. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's really horrible and it, it, to try to reverse it can be uh, difficult in a long process. So, you know, you really have to deal with that because 
as long as you've got all this toxic dysbiosis in the gut, you're going to have all this nasty stuff heading up into the liver. Um, yeah. And it's very hard to normalize your liver phase one, phase two, and all your detoxification if all this nasty stuff keeps going up every time you eat. Um, so you really have to start with the gut. And that will help to reduce the inflammation in the body and lower your risk of hypercoagulable uh, responses to things. Because uh, the lower your overall inflammation and your systemic inflammation, the easier it's going to be for you to weather these kinds of stresses that you come across. And again, cleaning up your extracellular matrix space, that's the fluid that bathes every cell in the body with this pulsatile movement that comes from the primary respiratory mechanism, you know, eight times to 10 times a minute that just, you know, bathes and soothes, you know, every cell in the body. And the best way to do that is to make sure you have adequate you know, cleaning up of your lymphatic fluid, of your blood, of your kidneys, your liver, you know, with any of the drainage medicines that you prefer, uh, clean eating is the best thing that you can do. Um, and so these are the things, you know, adequate antioxidants, you know, supplements that you, you may need, appropriate physical exercise, keep your blood moving, and a stress reduction. You know, we're all living in a, a time where, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are very caught in that fear cycle um, and if you're caught in that fear cycle, you're going to have really increased cortisol levels. That in and of itself can create hypercoagulability. Um, so you have to learn to let go of your fear. You have to recognize, you know, step away from this psyop that we're being exposed to and realize that you can have control over your life and your family's life um, and start taking positive steps. Um, and, and I do believe that having some um, connection to um, a higher power in, in a spiritual way and, you know, putting your faith in that higher power and realize that good always triumphs over evil. And it's just going to take a certain um, tipping point for humanity to realize that they have to choose the side of good <laughs> before things are really going to change. I love that you mentioned that because such a foundation of my practice is uh, we know the physical and we know all, the, all these things, but these complex chronic patients that we both see, um, I always want to make sure that they have some sort of connection to uh, higher power or whatever their belief system is in that there, there is um, hope. And there is, uh, because sometimes it gets so, if you're watching the news for one, <laughs> it gets so heavy. And so to encourage people to, to think on a, a little bit different plane can be really helpful. Otherwise it's uh, dark and dreary. <laughs> yeah, you have to turn off mainstream media because yeah, most yeah. of it's propaganda anyway. So right. you can't uh, allow that fear driven because you're never going to get better until yeah. you do that. So, you know, for me, um, many years ago, I was exposed to the, um, practice the Falun Dafa. And Falun Dafa is a meditation system of mind and body, where as you improve your moral character and do simple exercises, you ascend spiritually. It began in 1999 in China and it's spread all over the world. Um, and so if you align with the, the basic truths that, that support all of everything in the universe, number one being truth, yeah. number two being compassion, mm -hmm. and number three being tolerance and forbearance. And the closer we uh, align with those, and the more we understand that those will always prevail over anything that's negative, right? right? Then we can always have hope that's and right. ascend to a higher level. And, and that's the way you get better because, you know, so much of your illness is really comes from your emotional and psychological state. Yeah. So what else do we have on the, so we've talked about fibrin, we've talked about platelets, talked about the symptoms clinically and uh, see what else that I wanted to talk about. Um, talk about treatment for sure. We go, we talked just briefly about platelets, but I, you may want to. Um, yeah. Um, again, let's uh, talk about some of the consequences that happen mm -hmm. when you have excessive soluble fibrin in the uh, blood vessels and why it's such an issue. Well, if you have this sludge that's lining the blood vessel, number one, you can't get oxygen out. Mm -hmm. You also can't get nutrients out. You also can't get wastes back in for, you know, elimination. And the lymphatics, you know, out in the tissues get all congested and they can't dump stuff and they get sticky. So you've got intravascular inside the blood vessels and extravascular outside the blood vessel spaces. 
that are compromised and stuck and swollen and can't move things. They can't move toxins. They can't move nutrients, vitamins, you know, growth factors, except, you know, necessary minerals. Um, and so you, you get organ and tissue compromise. And that's why you have a lot of these symptomatology because you, you know, especially your brain is very compromised. Also, when the vessels have that sludge, they become rigid and they can't respond to the autonomic nervous system's constriction or dilatation orders that the autonomic nervous system is always given. So what happens when you have rigid blood vessels? You have alterations in your autonomic responses and control of blood pressure. So either these people have high blood pressure, they have difficulty controlling, or they have what's called POTS, yes. right? Because their blood vessels are stuck open and when they lay down, they're okay. And they go to get up quickly and they faint because their blood vessels can't constrict rapidly to get blood to the head. Mm -hmm. So almost all of the patients that I see uh, who've been diagnosed previously with, you know, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome are mold patients who are hypocritical. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Um, now, does histamine play into the um, form any sort of the coagulation cascade? Is there any co correlation with excess mast cell stuff with this? Or are they so sort of two separate issues? I think that they are. I Don't ask me to tell you the biochemistry of how they're connected sure. because I don't know that. But mast cell activation creates inflammation, releases yeah. a tremendous amount of cytokines. That's also going to stimulate the coagulation cascade. So that's my theory just, too, is exactly the, how, how is probably prostaglandin related or something because yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, we've been treating mast cell activation, Jill, probably for years, long before anybody called it that because it was right. part of, it's part of the whole syndrome of inflammation yes. that we've been seeing for years in those incredibly sensitive patients that can't take anything at all, you know, explode anytime yes. you try to do something with them, right? Right. Um, the other thing that I wanted to have everyone know is that when you go to treat hypercrigability, you must take it low and slow. Mm -hmm. Because what's happened is when that uh, fibrin has um, developed on the, let's put up one slide. Um, okay. Perfect. That I have. I, I can hit share screen. Can I? Yeah. Do you have to do yeah. that? I think you should. Okay. Now let me pick what I want to. I want to pick a window. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I want to do slide twenty-three, and I'll make sure that um, you have. this okay now let's just this is the way the blood's going down through it now this is that soluble fibrin that's on the layer of the blood vessel wall right this is the endothelial cell here okay now this is a real tight formation here of soluble fibrin and you've got all kinds of things stuck in here so when you actually go to start releasing this all of these big bad boys, like these pathogens and toxins and things down in here are going to be released. So you're going to have to be ready to deal with them as they're released. Also, though, what can get trapped in here is thrombin. So thrombin itself can get trapped here in this fibrin sludge layer. Well, there's no crosslink fibrin. This is all soluble fibrin, but it gets, you know, gets not locked down pretty tight. Um, and so sometimes as you go to release this, if you release it too quickly, that thrombin will cause a paradoxical dramatic increase in the amount of fibrin uh, formation you know, that is made. So you've got to really take your time and do this slowly and um, you know, just eat away at this. It depends on you know, how long people have been ill um, and uh, you know, whether they're... Um, you know, how much uh, sort of gunk they've got and how many problems they have. Mm -hmm. Also, um, just to show you, this is the um, slide from the um, presentation from this Dr. Um, Nemerson, and I've adapted it from one of the lectures from Dr. Berg from Mission. So here's the um, inside of the endothelial cell, the, the capillary bed. So you know, a red blood cell is seven microns, right? So if you've got this 
fibrin, which is only one micron here on the layer of the endothelial cell. It goes from two seconds for oxygen to go across in the absence of any fibrin to over five minutes if there's just one micro, you know, micron of fibrin there. So that's really a dramatic change in the time it takes for oxygen. And this is why people have pain in their muscles. This is why people can't exercise. <laughs> this, you know, there's, there's a lot going on here. And this is in addition, um, I'll, I'll, you can stop the sharing now. Okay, that you can stop, do I have to stop the share? Okay. There we go. Yeah, if you could stop and I'll stop. try it. Uh, if you can't. I yeah, know. there we go. Okay. You got it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, we can see you again. This Wonderful. is another reason, you know, not only do we have all of the mitochondrial problems, because the mold toxins just stop the ribosomes in the mitochondria, the, the, the mold toxins also stop the ribosomes in, in all of the, you know, dividing cells, it suppresses bone marrow function, does all this stuff. Right. You also have to worry about what the hypercoagulability has done. So we've got all these different layers of problems that we have to deal with. Um, when you go to detoxify somebody, say you're starting to detoxify mold, you're starting to take the toxins out of the body using the gut, getting into sweat a lot if they're able to, you know, doing, doing a lot of glutathione, or if you're using lipids or whatever you're doing. If you start to mobilize a lot of these stored toxins rapidly, you're going to stimulate a tremendous amount of hypercoagulable response. A lot of the Herxheimer reaction is actually people getting hypercoagulable. Same thing with heavy metals. Yeah. Um, heavy metals are just really, bad boy toxins. And as you start to mobilize them from where they're stored in the matrix, out in tissues, then and move them through the bloodstream to the liver and out, you are gonna have a lot of issues with coagulation being stimulated by those bad toxins as they're going through the bloodstream. That's why whenever you are treating um, Herxheimer reactions, you need to include enzymes and not just fibrinolytic enzymes, but also often proteases. Uh -huh. Proteolytic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk, yeah. um, we have about a good 10 minutes left. Let's, let's maybe go a little bit to treatments and, and what we can do about this. This is so fascinating. And really, I'm sure the listeners and myself, and it's covering such a spectrum of our patients. I mean, I wonder if there isn't if there is a patient that doesn't have some issue with this because it's inflammation, infection, toxin related. And I think that's all of my population. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. almost all of my patients are on some kind of enzyme. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the hole that I see in the vast majority of the patients that come to me from other practitioners. I um, agree. And I want to just, again, because I'm so glad to have you here and your expertise. And I have been doing this 20 years and there's many, many, many of our colleagues that don't really treat or understand this piece of it. And it's critical, it's absolutely critical. Yeah, it, it really is. So um, there are two main fibrinolytic enzymes. One is navokinase and the other is lumbrokinase. And unfortunately, there are many brands out there, but there are only a few that actually really work. And I don't know whether you want me to name those or not name those or Let's tell do, you. Because this is all commercially free of, it doesn't matter. There's, we can say okay. All right. And I have no commercial yeah. <laughs> you know, arrangements with these companies at all. So it's, it's not me. Really, I was taught this by um, Gary Klepper years ago, and he's right. The... Natokinase from Allergy Research Group, the soft gels, yeah. they have a 36 and they have a 100. I think they're discontinuing the 36. I wish they wouldn't. But they're yeah, soft. Nice to start those people on that low dose, isn't it? The yeah. Some, especially the kids, sometimes it's better. Yeah. Um, they, for some reason, are more effective. And I don't know what, what it's the way that that soft gel is dissolved in the um, lower on in the gastrointestinal tract or not. Any of those nanokinases that come in capsules, they're just not worth their, their time. Now, there are some kids that have been too young to swallow even the small little football of nanokinase. And so I'll use sometimes a combination, natocerazyme, something like that, from uh, like Designs for Health, or I'll use a, a capsule one in applesauce, but use a much higher dose and hoping that I get it through the stomach, right? At least enough. Right. Now, of the lumbrokinases, I'm terribly sorry, but only the Canada RNA brand named Baluk works. Yeah, agree. Um, totally. It's the only one Baluk is it. Yeah, and, and I've 
been doing this for a long time. I started treating hypercoagulability, you know, in 2005, which is 16 years ago. I've had patients and I've had it substantiated. I have a patient in England who had tried because it was hard to get. And yeah. she tried both the doctor's best and the, and the algae research group, lumbar kinases. And she goes to see a good cranial osteopath. Well, each time she went off the brand name Blue and went to one of these other brands, the osteopath would say, your, your mechanism is all sticky. This wow. is bad. Uh-huh. Right? So, so I've had other people substantiate. Yeah. And he's, that's not the only example. But I've had other, you know, sub, substantiation of the fact that, you know, that, that one particular Japanese-made blue is the only one that really works. So think about, well, how do they work? Um, the navokinase works primarily inside blood cells. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be really helpful now with our problems that we have with spike protein damaging endothelial cells, right? Mm -hmm. The blue works both inside and outside the blood vessels, and it's said to be significantly stronger. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There are times for for me, natokinase tends to work best, and sometimes I use just blue, sometimes I use both of them at the same time. Um, The blue, um, only about 10% of it is said to be absorbed through the gut. So I gave both of these on an empty stomach. Way back, you know, Klepper taught that, you know, these are hard on the gut. I rarely see anybody have any trouble with them taking them on an empty stomach. I would agree also, if I've had not any issues and I have a lot yeah. of patients with gut issues, so. Yeah, and then all people always wigged out, well, I don't know, the natokinase is derived from soy. Well, there's so little of any kind of soy protein in the natokinase. I have not had any problems with people who are even you know, anaphylactically allergic yes. to soy, not having trouble with the, with the natokinase uh, from the allergy research group. I just haven't. Yes. Uh, you know, they're always worried about it. And I say, well, you know, you know, I'd really like you just to give it a try. And, and, and they just haven't had problems with it. Now, there are other serapeptidases. There are really good, lots and lots of different brands of, of, of serapeptidases and things and, and things that you can use for hypercoagulability. One that I really like um, is imported by Marco Pharma in Oregon. It's called Marcozymes, M-A-R-C-O-Z-Y-M-E-S. It's got some bromelain and other things in it. But for me, taking high doses of that several times a day for people who have been exposed to um, covid who have had been exposed to vaccinated people and are worried about transmission of the spike protein to them, that shedding of the spike protein that a lot of us are worried about, or the actual people who've had the vaccine itself that realize that maybe they did something they shouldn't have done. The marcozymes seem to help to break up that spike protein as it's circulating if it's in the bloodstream. I don't have any proof of that. This is a purely clinical observation. So, and it's only one doctor's experience um, so you really have to take it with a grain of salt, um, but that seems to be helpful. Now, sometimes um, you need to use heparin, mm-hmm. and I found that either the subcutaneous Lovenox or an intravenous heparin has always been far superior to any of the sublinguals. Yeah. I know some of the naturopaths like the sublinguals because they don't have access in many states to you know, you know, injectable medications. Some states they do. Um, then there are a lot of other homeopathic herbs that work. Of course, I talked about the omega fats helping. Uh, they also help the uh, blood vessels, the uh, vitamin E, the phospholipids. The phospholipids can they be incredibly healing to the blood vessels and the endothelial lining, um, as well as certain herbs. Uh, there are herbs that help. Donshen is a wonderful herb that helps uh, with the coagulation issues. Um, so these are all things that you can use as well as the things such as, you know, a, a clean diet, uh, lowering their insulin resistance, fixing their gut dysbiosis, fixing liver detoxification pathways, you know, uh, adequately hydrating themselves, appropriate exercising, reducing stress and all those things. Now, um, you know, there are other, you know, herbs that can help, you know, ginkgo can sometimes help. Uh, other anti-inflammatories and antioxidant types of herbs can help. And there's so many that uh, it's not worth trying to, to yeah. name them. Um, now, again, if the platelets are really activated, then sometimes you will need to use, I would use an 81 milligram baby aspirin a day um, with the high dose uh, essential fatty acids. Now, some of the caveats to that are someone has to undergo surgery. You really need to stop your, um, your omegas 
your vitamin E and your aspirin or NSAIDs a good two weeks prior to surgery. And you can stop, restart them as soon as there's hemostasis after surgery, like 48 hours if there's no bleeding. Or usually after wisdom teeth extraction, you wait till all of the oozing is, is brown in color and then they can restart those. I generally will stop the fibrinolytic enzymes only 48 hours before surgery. Mm-hmm. And I've had, never had any problem with bleeding during surgery. Even if people have to go into surgery acutely and they're on these enzymes, then you just have to have them let the surgeon know. So they may just have to hold a little longer, but they'll still clot. You know, yeah. they, they will. what's really dangerous if their platelets are fully blocked by high dose NSAIDs or high dose aspirin, then that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I have not had issues and I usually just recommend patients stop before and there's no problem at all. Yeah. And, and they can, they stop 48 hours before with the fibrinolytics and, yes. and restart them again, 48 hours later, or if they have a drain, you know, once the drain's removed or once the, you know, the wisdom teeth, the drainage has become brown and they really don't have any trouble um, at, at all with it. Yeah. So do you keep patients on these for um, months or years or forever, or just during the acute inflammatory phase or what kind of a time frame are they looking at? Cause I found um, who need them and chronic issues. They often stay on them for quite a while. They feel yes, quite a while. And then if they do have one of the genetic SNPs, you know, one in four people are really susceptible to mold problems. Yes. One in five are susceptible to getting hypercoagulable under stress uh-huh. of any kind. Wow. So, and the most common are th- protein S deficiencies, yep. you know, high lipoprotein A's, high alpha uh, two antiplasmins, um, uh, protein C's. So If they have a significant genetic weakness, which becomes obvious when you treat them, Mm -hmm. you recheck them and they still have a very low protein S, then you know that that's a genetic weakness and they may need to stay or they have a high PI-1, plasminogen activase inhibitor one, they may need to stay on fibrinolytic enzymes their whole lives. Or they may need to always know to take them during periods of stress, any kind of stress, illness, injury, you know, emotional stress, physical stress, those kinds of things. So it just depends. Some patients will need to always be on them in order to stay healthy. Some people will need to, like, when people get a mold hit, they yeah. always have to have their yeah. enzyme because exactly. they're not going to get over that, you know, as quickly as they would if they don't use their enzyme. So right. healing the gut with things like Restore and using your enzymes are as important as your things to reduce inflammatory cytokine and to bind the toxins and get them out of the body. So, you know, that's always in my mold hit protocol. So people need to understand it when to use them. And that's part of what I teach my patients. Well, Dr. Corson, this has just been loaded with such great information. And I just appreciate your work and being on here to get, get the information out. Because like I said, this is actually not common that not only our colleagues, but even patients understand. And this could be one of the most important things that we're missing. I really feel like this is so critical. Um, and just thank you for your inquisitive nature, your curiosity, your willingness to continue to learn and grow like we all do. And just for coming here and bringing this great information today. So, so, so important. Thank you so much for asking me. I was very honored. I've been an admirer of your work as well. So it's a mutual admiration society. And we do sort of (laughs) work. We we are in the same circle. Absolutely. Yeah. And we all need each other. I always learn from my colleagues and friends like you too. I'm from the same tribe. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. And everybody, I know this information has been really useful. I'll be sure and include links and uh, link to Dr. Corson's site as well. And thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon.